Because I brought some armor with me, this actually is my normal training. Now, we're going to be looking at the difference that armor makes to the person who is wearing it and the person who is trying to kill them. I should be wearing it, they should be trying to kill me. Good luck, sir. First, <laughs> can everybody hear? Can you hear it back? Yes, fine, okay. I'm sorry, what did you say? <laughs> I said, if in the front row, we'll be hit with axes. Excellent! Yeah, okay. And before we start, I have a very important question to ask. Does my bum look big in this? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who answers yes gets to practice later. Okay. Yes. Yes. Very yes. 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 <laughs> All right. Now, um, if we start with the age of the bum, murder people with swords. Um, you can't have a sword. Okay. Now, last year we used sharp swords. This year, um, I just didn't feel like doing that again. <laughs> it was a little bit risky last year. Um, so we're using blunt swords, but I want you to imagine that they were sharp. Um, about as sharp as an ordinary kitchen knife in places. And what would happen if Ken comes and strikes me? Yes? I would probably die. Is that fair? So, what will happen when Ken comes to try and strike me, I will snap the sword out of the way, and as Fury says, run the sword over his arm and stab him in the chest. And wearing this kind of clothing, that would be sufficient, wouldn't it? Yeah. And, of course, there are lots of different ways to do that, more or less efficiently. You can, for example, as he comes to strike, parry and strike in a single motion, sticking the sword through his face, uh, which just speeds things up a little bit, but basically this offers no great protection against one of these. So, piece by piece, we're going to put on most of a suit of early to mid 15th century armor. Now, the period matters because in the 1380s, a genius or a team of geniuses working in the lab figured out how to heat treat plate steel. Before that, almost all armor was made of iron. And iron is much more susceptible to being penetrated with swords than steel is. So, bit by bit, over the next 40 years or so, the iron armor was being replaced by plate steel armor. This had all sorts of consequences, not least the armor, the armor is less likely to be formed. So once it's made its shape, it's likely to keep it because it's a bit springy. Which means that the structures that we're going to be putting on today will actually work. So there was a, because of the technological development, there was a significant change in the way armor was produced and worn. Let's start with the <coughs> shall we? Chaps, do you give me a hand? Okay. First things first. A knight does not dress himself, right? Oh, it's impossible. Do you guys know what you're doing? Yeah, okay, so open that one up, open that one up. Okay, that's all right. So I basically stand here and let my pages and squires get to work. Of course, if they are slow or inaccurate or make the armor pivot, they should be savagely thrashed later. <laughs> <laughs> this is 1400 and we can get away with that kind of thing. Okay. Now, of course, highly trained squires are a lot quicker than your average 21st century swordsmanship student who gets to assist with the uh, armour about, I don't know, once a month or something like that. I don't wear it terribly often. Okay. So this is, you notice it's very tight. This is just one piece. By itself, it's basically useful. So we have the rest of the cuirass. The long bits of the front, which rattles and sort of clatters, and already it's quite heavy. It is quite heavy. It's a lot less heavy than you're wearing. I carried this stuff in canvas bags out here, and it was a real pain. But once you actually got it on, it's okay.
Okay, this is the tricky bit. This is the hardest bit of the whole, whole procedure. You'll notice, by the way, that I've got no arm on my legs. Okay? This is because it's not ready, which is a kind of rock upon tradition, right? So, um, I should be going about with armor only on the top part, which is fine, people did that. Have you all heard of a Elizabethan writer called Sir Philip Sidney? No? He has the enormous distinction of having the same birthday as me, so he can remember, but he died in 1586 because at a battle on the continent he got injured in the leg and it went gangrenous and he died. Queen Elizabeth was very upset. But the point was, he wasn't wearing his leg armour either. So if it's good enough for Sir Philip, it's going to have to be good enough for me. Now, <laughs> you can see, I hope, that this stuff allows extraordinary range of motion. You get this idea of a man in armour sort of going, yes? But this, because of the way these curves fit around each other, you've basically got a ball here, yeah, which allows all this thoracic movement. Yeah. And already wearing just this, the, the main sort of squidgy bits are pretty well protected. Okay? And right here, there are two layers of hardened steel which will almost certainly stop any thrust from pretty much any handheld weapon. Now, you've all heard of the Dark Ages, yes? Okay. I know people who ought to have won a Dark Award, only they didn't have the good sense of dark, who put the armour on and then challenged people like crossbow makers. Oh, my curious can stop your crossbow job. And um, having been persuaded to remove the curious and hang it on the tree, Set the crossbow man goes and the bolt goes right through the pure ass and into the tree. So don't for a minute imagine that this will stop serious projectiles. It will stop, um, for example, English uh, longbow arrows on the first hit. Now what tends to happen is the first hit, because this is curved, the, the arrow is deflected off, but it's dense the metal slightly and weakens it. Second hit in the same place will tend to lead to penetration. And when the English are sending four arrows into the air before the first one lands, uh, well, you better have good luck as well as good arms. Okay, next up is the arms, which are these pieces here. And they tie on the string, let me get the string. Okay, not you. That's just the hanging string. Okay. Now, these are not symmetrical, okay? The right and the left are significantly different. And they have to go in exactly the right place, and they are then, I kid you not, tied on with string. So, this is where armor tends to fail when it fails. Somebody manages to cut the string, and your armor is no longer in the right place, and what was this beautifully engineered, I can break down in this stuff, suddenly becomes a prison. Okay, just close it up. That's it. And that goes over. And the button there. Yeah. Fortunately, the French are not currently attacking, so we have some time. While they're working, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Or I can just blather along as I usually do. <laughs> What's up there? The uh, buckles. Ah, the buckles there. Yeah. 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 And, okay, the jacket I'm wearing doesn't look like very much. The jacket I'm wearing costs almost as much as the arms. Because it took a very skilled craftsman quite a long time to make. Yeah. Not all armor custom made for the person Good question. Not all armor was custom made. Okay? Um, this level of armor, custom made and with the price tag match, gives you enormous range of mobility and a very elegant protection. But most of you couldn't afford it. Okay? So most of the armor that's been worn in the studio was basically bashed out for those who could afford it. Um, Although, a little higher. Those who, who, who uh, 
basically a quick fly row of deployment. And it was usually something very simple like a brush plate and a back plate, which didn't have all the room in front. So enough to make it feel a bit safer. Um, yeah, that should do it. Okay. There we go. So, as you can see, the C3PO effect is. <laughs> yeah, it comes from here. And you can you have a pretty good range of motion, not a perfect range, because the arm will stop at about this. So you don't you can't bend the arm any further back than that. Okay? But you have all of this and you have rotation um, actually pretty good. And of course when somebody grab a sword, when somebody sort of cuts me over the arm. Okay. Question. That's a very good question. Does it give you any room to lose or gain weight? Unfortunately for me, I lost about four kilos after the cure after the <laughs> um, But I think the armor anticipated it because it was a bit tight, and now it's further. So, <laughs> so um, basically, no. If you gain weight, you have to buy new armor. If you lose weight, you have to put padding under your armor. Because obviously you can't really adjust the method. Once it's been heat treated, you can't really adjust it. The advantage of the iron armor is it could be quite easily adjusted after it had been fitted once because it was made of iron. Whereas this is heat treated uh, spring steel, and once it's heat treated and it's set, it's very difficult to adjust. <coughs> okay. Now, next up is the shoulders, and here we have a range of choice. We have down here we have little shoulders for. Use, but we also have hoofing great big poles. Which do you think is his weapon? Big one. Oh, big one. Oh, oh. okay. If you can see to your size, your poles are too small, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that way. Uh, uh, that way. That's it. Okay. And okay, there are two points set over there, and these things will tie up. Okay, so you need points. Now, this is where the engineering really comes in. So the points go in the top of your bowl, and then uh, through the jacket. So the reason the jacket is so important is because the weight of these pauldrons is going to be carried on the jacket. It's not being carried just on my shoulder. Likewise, the weight of the armor um, is just under it. Tied to the jacket, and the jacket is carrying a lot of weight. Uh, if that wasn't the case, this would be an awful lot more difficult to wear. So basically, the jacket is um, a feat of structural engineering. It does worry me slightly that my main shoulder protection is held on by a piece of string. But this is historical. <laughs> <laughs> this is what they did, and I guess it, um, it does get cut. There is a uh, buckle on the UPR, which will keep it in place until you can find another piece of stuff. There you go. Yeah. And as you can see, I can lift my arms, which, if you're French, is very important. Oh, the string is historically accurate as well. Oh yeah, these strings have been carefully braided according to the proper medieval Very, very, very few got the point at the side, so that it's interesting. Um, but these have the brass points on them, which is why they're called points. Um, and they are, um, there are various instructions in manuals which tell you how they should be made. Because if you, for example, if you just wear um, that's a leather thong. If you have leather thong pulling your arm together, they will suddenly snap. Whereas these, they give slowly over time so you get a chance to see that they're praying before you can Now, even with these amazing things on, yeah. Oh, here's a top tip. Do not go swimming in your armor. <laughs> <laughs> right? Armor is, generally speaking, a really good idea. Yes, it works. It's fantastic. You have mobility, you have a, a measure of involvement, and it's right now, I'll take you to all fucking. 
it gives you this sense of, oh my God, nothing can touch me. Right? That's fantastic. But there are all sorts of examples of um, people on ships who, at the moment they hit the water, really wish they were not going out. Because you just go straight down and there's nothing to do that. Um, also, with weather like we're having at the moment, the weather continues. Because what's going to happen next is the helmet goes up. Now, I ought to be wearing an arming cap. I also ought to be wearing a coat of chainmail underneath all this. But guess what? That's not ready yet. I thought you'd like to see this, so I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I have. The helmet, um, you guys can grab that. It's a fantastic, fantastic thing. Okay? The visor comes up and it opens like a Lamborghini. Yeah? And wearing these shoulders, there's no way I can put it on myself. Yes? How heavy is the whole set when it's ready? Uh, the whole set when it's ready should be around 25 feet. Yeah? It's not too bad. It's like a nice bike. You go hiking. It's a lucky bike. It's good. I had it specially made so that we do fit it off. Yeah, question. Um, one question you your shoulder pads aren't symmetrical. Why is it that your right arm is the sun conquer? That's a very good question. My arm is not symmetrical because armor from this period, the tiny armor from this period, was never symmetrical. The left is always better covered than the right. Because most flows will come in on the right hand side and most um, uh, you're, you're doing most of your starts from the right hand side. And so you want more mobility here and more defensiveness here. Okay? Now my right arm is currently uncovered. With the chain now that was held, but we also have um, in that thing over there a little disc that can hang just to cover the arm. It was just too much trouble to get it fitted in time. Uh, are there any historical cases of, uh, so to speak, left-handed armor? That's a very good question, which I don't know the answer. But email me, and I'll contact my armor, and I'll ask it to email me. Oh, well, there it is. Yeah, and again, okay, that just ties in with a piece of string. And just hang it. Okay, now, can you guys clip that together? So, the helmet clips together. And suddenly it is more difficult to talk. <laughs> we'll be unclipping it in a moment. Show do the button. Yeah, okay. So, so, right now, I can't move my jaws over. This is a good thing. Basically, everything is now locked in place. So blows here end up getting taken in my shoulders and not so much with my skull and my neck. Okay? So, it's not optimal for addressing a group of people on the Saturday mornings in July of 2014, but it is brilliant that people try and smack you in the head. Now, you notice my visor is up. I can see to about here. Yes, I have some visibility. As soon as that goes down, I can see to about here. Which means that if Ken and I are fighting, where's my bloody sword? <laughs> <laughs> okay. If Ken and I are fighting, if Ken can get behind me, so I can't see him. <laughs> yes, but fortunately, if he hits me, I don't care. <laughs> now, question. Uh, camera. Oh yeah, do you want to stick a camera on? Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, you'll notice that this visor doesn't have a cap. <coughs> What's the radar ratio there? Aha! Ah, you spotted the. Uh, Aerial. This is so I can receive communications. <laughs> so I in the sky. No. What? Okay. Nobody has a concrete, perfectly historically documented exact idea of what this thing does. Okay. Our best guess is it's a form of uh, crumpled bone. Yeah. So if you get hit in the back of the head, the this thing breaks. And as it gets crushed and broken off, it absorbs the energy of the blood. Yeah? So we reckon it's basically a kind of sacrificial arm. Yeah? Okay. So. <laughs> yeah.
Yes, so. <laughs> All right, so, here's the thing. You notice that my helmet does not, this does not have a cast on it. Yeah? So it just goes up and down. This was normal up until about 14, 20, 14, 30, when cast started to become more common. In Fiora's treatise, written in about 1400, one of them is dated to 1409, um, there's a, a play there, having got me close, he lifts up my visor and stabs me in the face. <laughs> you can't do that if the visor is slipped down, because while you're fiddling with the clip, I'm going to be able to think you. Okay? So, now, firstly, combat in armour is not terribly similar, in some respects, to combat out of armour. Um, but from a, a psychological perspective, huh, let me just stick my gloves on, so I'm properly protected. Can't see a bloody thing, never mind. Okay, these gloves, so these gloves are um, about a century later in style, and about a fifth of the price of the proper ones. They're perfectly good for what we normally do, but again, <laughs> I haven't gotten around to getting the um, the, the gauntlet that would really fit with this suit yet. Not least because they're extremely expensive. Thank you. Very much. Okay. Now, if we do the play that we did before, thank you very much. Sorry, can you come to strike? Oh, yeah, just strike. Hit me in the head, okay. <laughs> we'll try again. Yeah. So I can do all the stuff that I was doing before, but what he has to do to get near me, is he has to exactly. Yeah. He has to get in close and he has to get that pointy end into the places, oh shit, <laughs> <laughs> where the arm doesn't belong. Now, it's probably a good idea to take the camera off now, but I really can't talk to you at all. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah. I can't hear a bloody thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's how you think on battlefields has 
or we can really think it's never going away. And the thing is, for your individual soldier, they would rather have a sodding great piece of metal on their head than be able to hear what their officers say. Yeah, and it seems reasonable to me. Okay. So, where was I? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's a dinosaur. Oh, okay. <laughs> the Polax. The Polax of Boo. This is just a fantastic tin open. Right? It's completely redundant against poor carrot. Yeah? Because, well, it'll go through a fencing mask like the fencing mask wasn't there. And we know this because we tried it. Not with carrot inside it. <laughs> but we stuck a fencing mask on a pole and we beat the crap out of it with swords and collapses and daggers and stuff. And particularly the dagger and the collapse went right through it. Yes? However, it's the, the reason this sort of weapon was so popular is that you can hit somebody hard enough to get through their arm. Okay? If you see the spike, set of four spikes here, okay? Where you just bring that again here, okay? If the if the the beak turn around, if if the beak strikes the armor, it will sl probably slide off. Yeah? But if the four points strike the armor, yeah, on a curved surface, one of them has to go uphill to the slide. Yeah? So it tends to sit. And so what will that what will then happen is if you hit really hot, you'll actually puncture the armor. Yeah? And then I'll get a broken arm and some nasty bleeding stuff underneath and you can pull me to the ground and then it will just try and stamp on me and yes, eventually they will get through and solve it. Those things are built for destroying the people who are dressed like this. Which strikes me as extremely unfair because, well, it's just as expensive and it ought to work. <laughs> okay. Now, um, before we move on to uh, other things... A question. Yeah. If you fall down, you get up your house. Firstly, firstly, horses in the Middle Ages, these, these are um, late 14th century men. Horses in this period, war horses particularly, were not as big as you think. They weren't just like gangster things with, with you know, like a saddle somewhere up there and you kind of climb up with a rope, right? If you see many of the pictures of knights on their horses, the feet are often below the level of the belly of the horse, right? A death grade is only something like 15 pounds. That is not a big one. So jumping onto the armor, I couldn't do it, but this guy was trained from pretty much from birth. I mean, he started training since when he was about the age of ten. His other most famous feat of arm, uh, famous by the way because he commissioned a biography of himself, which has fortunately survived, and he claims it's in his biography, but I've never I've never seen it refuted anymore. Um, you know siege ladders, where you have a castle and you stick a ladder against the wall and you climb up it, right? His feet of arm was to climb up the underside of a siege ladder without moving his feet. What? Yes. In arm. He would climb up the underside of a siege ladder without moving his feet. Right? Which suggests that his arm is significantly stronger than mine. Right? I've not yet tried doing a single pull-up in this armor. Um, I have a suspicion that I might fail. Um, and that is something I should, I should work towards, but I do not, I do not hereby promise that next year at Rockefeller we will bring a seed ladder and I will find it. No, I did not say that, and it's probably not going to happen. No problem. Okay. Any other questions on this before we take some of it up? Yes, sir. Uh, 
in some pieces of medieval art, you can see pictures of people stepping straight through guys or cutting through their helmets or uh, yes. stepping through people with armor. Oh, right. That's yes. completely true, right? That's a good question. Can you get through armor? Fury, in one of his um, guards of Poland, mentions that this, there's um, a first piece of issue here, which is go through a breastplate, uh, or rather a cuirass. He is almost certainly referring to an iron cuirass. Okay? This, you would have trouble getting through, um, even with a properly sharp point. Mostly because it was skip. Getting, getting it to fix on with these curves and lines, exactly so that the point coming in. So, um, if it's you know, so 14th century or 13th century, yes, it's feasible. Armour by this period, this by the way is based on, um, this is a copy of the Avant Armour, which is in the Kelvin Grove Museum in Zarte, uh, which is the earliest set of complete field armour that we have in existence. It's dated to about 1450. Um, and it is heat treated steel, and wearing this. You know, you can try. <laughs> but I am, I am fairly confident that you're not getting it. I mean, notice that I mean, this, the armor I'm wearing right now, I'm not even including the helmet, costs nearly twice what I paid for my car. Right? I, I don't really use the car, so my car just gets from A to B, but, you know, it gives you some idea of the sort of money we're talking about and the sort of priorities we're talking about. <laughs> um, but uh, this is um, what's the word? Okay, from this period on, the armor got better and better and better. And by by the time of Henry VIII, they actually found a way to armor the groin and the arse, the foot form. Okay, you'll notice that my arse is unarmored, and even if I have my leg plates, my arse will be uncovered because you can't ride a horse with a steel, a pair of steel trousers, which wouldn't work, right? So, um, if you think of the uh, timely death of King Charles the Rat in Berlin, who had invaded Switzerland, or tried to, in the late 15th century, he was eventually found in a ditch uh, with an enormous halberd wound in his ass, and then an enormous halberd wound in his head. And what they think was, as he was riding away, like, oh shit, this fucking Swiss are mad, Somebody stabbed him in the arse and fell off the horse, and then they just him. took his armour and threw him in a ditch. Yes? So, yes, do not show your arse to the Swiss, you've got no <laughs> idea what they're going to Still catch it a bit. I think it's basically what, there's a rivet that goes through them. So these are like rivet caps. And I think the reason they're like this is because it just gives you an extra spike to hit with just in case you need something. That's my opinion. No, so the spike on the end, that's very good. Does that help you go? Yes. 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 Uh, I was just. Uh, can I have your hand up, please? No. Uh, well, okay, <laughs> I'm not going to have to do that. I have to. Yes. The book here yeah. and all these handy joints in the armor. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, I was just wondering <laughs> if uh, I may, for example, here <laughs> and all kinds of places, yeah, yeah, yeah. hypothetically hook a person Absolutely. by them. Absolutely, yeah. The problem with armor is it's got lots of things you can hook. So, yeah, hooking somebody who's wearing armor is. You can poison it too. Like they did in the Absolutely, yes. We have in Fiori Street, guys, we have. Um, two uh, comedy poetry. One of them has uh, a rope attached to the end of a weight on the end, and what you're supposed to do is swing the rope around somebody's legs and pull. See, it works, even with my invisible rope. <laughs> and another poetry has a big box on the end, um, which has poison dust on it. And in this section of the manuscript, um, Fury manuscript is written for um, the Marcus of Carrara, and Fury says, 
Signora, 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 my Lord, my Lord, my Master, I know that you would never suit such trickery, but I include this sort of thing for the sake of knowledge. <laughs> and then he gives the recipe that he's producing the dust. <laughs> so yes, yeah, poison prolactis. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How long did it take for uh, Smith to make one uh, set of armor back in the day? Back in the day, I don't know. This Smith has been laboring tirelessly for about three years. Um, that's partly because of cash flow issues on my side. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, okay, I don't know exactly, but I would guess that this sort of armor would represent the work of a workshop. And you could, I mean, back in, in the old days, there wasn't one person made the whole piece of armor. Right? You'd have apprentices making some bits, you'd have masters making other bits, you'd have specialist engravers, specialist pitters, specialist heat treaters. They specialised in fire tickets. So you have a team of people working on your armour, and I don't know, I think it probably had a lot to do with your social status um, as to how quickly you've got your armour. I would guess, a, this is purely a guess, I would guess you might not get on your armour. I don't know. We do know that they did do things like we kick on. So if you captured somebody, if you captured, if you captured me on the battlefield, good luck. If you captured me on the battlefield, you would get to keep my armor. I would hate you forever with a long list of the box. Right? So people were taking armor as prizes, and some, sometimes if the person was a too good to shape, you could get a new for you. Particularly if you're a bit smaller than something like that. Um, and that's just, you know, fitting me to just getting the wings right. You see, when I do this, they don't catch. That took four fittings to get that thing right. Um, so again, the more, the more time you have, the more fittings you do, the better. Thank you. Don't answer the question. Why? Okay, thank you. Any other questions before we go? Yes, maybe back. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, are there any Differences in style. Yes, absolutely. Um, we identified at least four national styles of armor in this period. At least four. There are probably more. Um, and this is only in Europe. Outside of Europe, there are even more. Um, so we have uh, the, the Italians, of course, have the best in my opinion. Um, then the Germans, um, and by the end of the 15th century, they were making these incredible fluted. Uh, um, it looked like the clothes that they were wearing, right? So they had all these incredible pleats. I mean, literally pleated steel. Um, the English favoured a slightly plainer style um, up until any race got going. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a good armour. Someone who knows their armour will look at a suit of armour and say, oh, that came from northern Italy between 1460 and 1500. Yeah, they're probably better than that. Um, but, yeah. Honestly, armor isn't actually my, my area of expertise. Um, as you can see, I don't even have the complete suit yet. But <laughs> uh, so what I like to think is that you'd like to see. Yeah, so it could be kind of cool. And, okay, this is your one and only chance. Okay? Um, in my cell, anyone who comes along can stick sticky fingerprints all over my armor. There's a 1,000 push up penalty. <laughs> well, we're going to have to clean it anyway. Yeah, because it's been handled and all that. So, if you want to come and have a close look, I will allow it. <laughs> <laughs> Just this once. Okay? So, seriously, um, I think we, we finish it now. Those of you who want to get your hands on it and have a look at it. Um, Just before we do that, there's one last thing I want to point out about the ace. Coming up about the left. Side being to the right. Left and right. Left and right. Left side and to the right side. Yeah. Right. Okay. This armor, when I said it was complete, I meant it. In that there is an extra place which you get in the right way that fits on. Do you get that? Clips are over there. So they basically just stick it on. Yeah. 
So you have all these extra enormous pieces, uh, extra pieces that fit on steel and fit on steel, so that you are have extra layers of steel in between. Can you get that? Tricky, sir. It is a bit tricky. It kind of clips off the screen. Yeah. Yes. And of course, the trade is always weight and mobility over the track. So the more of these extra pieces I clip on, the less mobile I am, the harder it is to actually hit me. The harder you have to hit me to make anything like that. So you can see Go ahead and hit me with a sword. I don't care. <laughs> yeah? Because this side <laughs> Did you hear that? Very important. <laughs> Rock, paper, okay. scissors, uh, matter of life and death. That's right. So, strikes to my left side yeah, are going to be far less effective than strikes to my current right side. But of course, because my animal loves me and wants me to survive, I have had to keep to the right side as well. But still, they're always bigger and heavier on the left than they are on the right. So this needs to be mobile to strike. This is actually my driving arm. If I was on horseback, this arm doesn't move very much. It doesn't really matter. Yeah? This is actually for foot combat primarily. So on foot, you might still want this. So it really depends on what you're going to carry. If you've got to carry a polo, I'm having that, no question. Right? Just a sword and one arm. And of course, it's just how long it will pin. So if that comes out and this falls off, then at least I have my rest of the steel in there. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, how many left-handed knights or soldiers were at the time? That's a very good question. To answer it, let me refer to Fiora again. By the way, you all know who Fiora is, right? I've been educating you a lot over the last decade. <laughs> okay. Fury in one play of the amount of combat says, and this works well against left handers. He explicitly says that. And um, we, we tend to think that, okay, in the Middle Ages you weren't allowed to be left handed. That's not strictly true. It differed from place to place and time to time. My granny, for example, was almost certainly left handed. But she was brought up right handed because where she lived, when she lived, that's what she did. Um, but we know that there are plenty of left handed knights because several men in the big houses actually refer to how you should kill them. Yeah? <laughs> so they must be around. Why are you in the bubble? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How well can you wield a bow or a crossbow with an arm? A bow? Okay. I could probably shoot a long bow with this. Um, I felt so easy. Particularly that the squire to like uh, I wouldn't want to do this. But see, crossbows and longbows aren't like a weapon. Knights did not normally carry. You might go hunting with them, but if you were hunting, you'd wear your hunting armor. <laughs> and your hunting armor looks quite a bit like this, but you probably wouldn't bother with your arms. Uh, you probably have your fear out on because it's kind of squishy, isn't it? If you're hunting, you might not want any noise, but you might even take that. So, again, you're talking about incredibly rich people, and this is the, it, it has some of the same kind of social significance of a pearl. Right? It's, yes, it performs a function, but really its main function is, God, look what you need. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because again, on the battlefield, you want to appear rich. Because then, if things don't go well, you will be captured and ransomed instead of simply killed. Yes? So, I mean, soldiers have always tended to wear their wealth and their bodies when they go into battle, partly for that reason. Um, partly also because they tend not to trust the people in the baggage train. <coughs> yeah? But again, armor has a definite fling factor, as you can know that too. And um, the original is somewhat more decorated than this. Um, incidentally, um, on this side, the etching reads, 
don't tell my wife how much this costs. <laughs> In Latin. And on the other side it says, I ordered a curious, not a post. So, uh, he's probably, we're heading towards time, we can finish up here, and I'll just hang around and you guys can come up and have a look and go, ooh, well, I'm going to check it out. Okay? So, thank you very much for your attention. And come to the Guinness Board, 2nd of October in Helsinki, and we have bits of paper for people who are interested in action training. Thank you very much.